I'd like to thank Dave again for that very insightful and inspirational uh, uh, presentation. Um, <clears throat> we're going to go to the uh, uh, Q&A session. And what we're going to do, and I hope this works, <laughs> this is a, a microphone. And we're going to throw it to each other and speak into it. He says, uh, so I just need to get it running. <coughs> One, the right projector there. And this. Ah. Well done. Okay, so. So we've got um, approximately, well, less time than we thought, but we have <laughs> got some time. Um, if you, if we can, t if you can direct your questions to me, and um, if you could initially be asking, focusing your questions on Dave, and where um, uh, Phil Card, you are our DBC, has an institutional response. That is a, a response from the senior executive team at Leeds Beckett, and he will uh, respond uh, after Dave Gilborn. So, can I have a show of hands of, for anyone who, who has a question? How many questions do we have? One, two, three. Two uh, questions. No, just keep yourself to one question, and can you keep it brief, please? Okay, so we've got one, then two, then three. I need a fourth. Okay, there you go. It's going to be very embarrassing if somebody yes. from the sports background dropped. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is excruciatingly painful to me, Kevin, as you'll be able to explain to Dave, because I actually found myself in accord with what Dave was saying right the way through, and that's very unusual. <laughs> yes, it is unusual for anyone who knows uh, Jonathan. Uh, I, isn't that right, Anne? Yeah, well done, yeah. <laughs> So on, on that basis, my only course is to ask you, well, assuming I sit, we share a similar agenda, where do we go next? Yes, I, I'm quite happy to pick up your challenge of contesting these lines whenever they come forward, but I would like to do something more proactive than that. So what am I best advised to do? Do you want me to take them one at a time? Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Let's, take a, let's take a few. So we, we've got that okay. one from, who was the second one? Ab Abby? Yeah, Abby, yeah. Good luck, John. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> speak into um, it, into the, yeah. I, I suppose, yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> My question is, in terms of lies, do you think it comes more from America than it is UK, or do you think it's equal? And, uh, no, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, that's it. Now pass it back now. We'll come back to you if we have time. Uh, Hi. Um, my question is, have you um, controlled your data um, with um, factors including class alongside race? Mm -hmm. And also, if I'm no. asked any question, no. uh, uh, please do be self critical. And um, what's it like being white and um, being in education? Have you had comments said to you, such as, in the opposite, positive racism? Yeah. <laughs> 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 He's lost control already. <laughs> okay. Yep. Can we go with those three sure. for, yep. for now? Um, yep. T to address the last one, I'm incredibly aware of the fact that I don't look like the majority of the folks doing CRT um, and um, that's not coincidental either. The, 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 the fact that the only university based research centre on racism in education in an English university is run by a white professor is not a coincidence and it doesn't denote that I'm cleverer than my colleagues or that I worked harder than them. It denotes that as Bell says in the Rules of Racial Standing, even when it comes to the people fighting racism, the ones that are identified as white benefit from their whiteness, whether they like it or not. Now, I try and um, use that whiteness against itself. So I try never to be at the, the, the head of particular movements, that whole kind of white saviour thing. I'm very aware of that. Um, but, uh, so I try and be a tool, and my daughter's in front of you, and she'll tell you that lots of people describe me as a tool. Um, <laughs> but I mean it in the kind of Black and Decker sense of, of being, being useful. 
So um, when I work with uh, black campaign groups, for example, it's very useful to them ver to, to bring out the white guy who can debunk the statistics from the local authority. Um, to bring out a professor who looks like a university professor in the eyes of the races, who then doesn't talk like one, so debunks the racism, um, is, is sometimes quite useful. So I'm, I'm very aware of, of that contradiction and I try not to fall into the traps. But um, the, the traps are many and I'm sure that I do fall into them, but I, I count on colleagues and friends of colour to point them out and to help me do it better the next time. Um, in terms of the question about what we do now, you're absolutely right. I didn't mean in the end. I mean, you know, you talk about this stuff that, that's, that's intricately wound through the, the, the very fabric of society, and then you're supposed to conclude. And, you know, I'd really like to go, so what we need to do is this. So the ending's always a bit of an anticlimax. I didn't mean to suggest so wait until some of it happens in front of you and then take action. Of course, get out there the, the, the message of any movement against um, racial injustice is, is working together, um, is joining together in groups, is strategizing politically. Um, but on the other hand, don't think that when the world is still racist at the point that you die that you failed. One of the key things about CRT is, well, if, if, if racism is really that ingrained, don't for a moment imagine that, that there is a magic bullet, that if we just do something smarter <coughs> next time, we will defeat it. This is an, an ongoing battle, and, and, and I often quote here um, the best British sociologist ever, in my opinion, a guy called Stuart Hall, who, um, in an interview with a, a black community project, was asked to lay out, what does racism mean, Professor Hall? And he talked incredibly eloquently. In five minutes, he was better than anything I've, I've done in that hour or whatever it was. And, and the person interviewing him looks really crestfallen and says, well, if, it, if racism's that subtle and that powerful, what's the point in that? We're, we're a little group making curriculum materials for local primary schools. What's the point? And Stuart Hall says, you struggle where you are. You can't do everything you fight the battles that you <coughs> can fight, that you access, because if you try and fight all of those battles, you will die. The system is bigger than you. So um, the Raza Studies thing I was talking about, one of the young women that works with, or used to work with Raza Studies, was mentoring uh, young Latina uh, women as they, they were trying to get through um, the system. And she was with them for a year. In the first meeting, she said to them, we've got to set goals for the next year. What goals are we going to set? And most of them said, oh, I don't know, that we graduate? And she said, no, goal number one, this time next year, we're all still alive. That's the goal. The other ones, we subsume under that. And it, it kind of freed the kids up to start thinking strategically. They didn't have to think of themselves as selling out. If somebody said something and they felt, if I actually speak up at this point, I, I, I could really get hurt. That they pick their battles, they strategize that they don't become just a punching bag for racism. Um, the question about the UK and the US, do I think it's worse in the US than, uh, than the UK? No, I think it's as bad in both places. Some things are worse in some, some things are, are, are worse on the other side. I was saying to uh, somebody um, before the food was unveiled um, <coughs> that uh, actually the disproportionate representation of black young men in the prison system is worse in the UK than in the US. US. And when I mentioned this to a, um, an African-American professor, he, he didn't believe it. He said, that, that's just not possible. And it's an official statistic. I, I, I had to send him the report. So although race is talked about a lot more in the States, there's a public language for race, there isn't a public language for it here. Uh, and in terms of you know, um, deaths at, at police hands, our police don't, don't tend to shoot people dead as often as they do in the States. They kill them behind closed doors. You look <laughs> at the statistics on death in custody. That's where our campaign is around. Um, in terms of the, the, the question about have I controlled for class and other things, um, yes and no. So when uh, I'm, I'm looking at free school meals stuff, I, in, in the government sense, I'm controlling for, for class. Um, 
uh, I've written elsewhere, and we can talk about that, about this idea of intersectionality, that you can't actually understand class or race or, or gender or sexuality or <coughs> disability. You can't understand them in isolation. They are all always working in connection. And that's true, but we have to start somewhere. And every one of us starts with the thing that drives us. The strange thing is that in this country, people like myself and Kevin and other colleagues in the room who put race at the start are constantly told that it's actually more complicated than that. That we ought to start with class. That we should start with something else. That starting with race makes us somehow um, crude. And the other thing is that actually a lot of the statistics, and I can send the paper to anyone who really likes statistics, the statistical models that people in government use to model inequalities remove racism. Because race, they will control for lots of different things and then say, well, if there's an, if there's an effect for race when we've controlled for <coughs> prior attainment, social class background, uh, income, all of those things, if there's any race left over, that'll be the racism. Whereas, in fact, the racism works through all of those other things. It works through prior attainment. It works through how you're graded. It works through which school you get into. It works through income, through parental education. So those models that pretend to be tremendously sophisticated are actually smoke and mirrors. They're very often a way in which the system says, look, when you actually look at it, there is no racism. But the models are developed by people that don't understand how racism works. Most of the models are developed by white, middle-class men. And so they're really bad at identifying how inequality works. That's why very often statistics are the last thing you need when you're interested in, in social justice, because numbers are really the start, not the end of the analysis. You have to get in close and personal with qualitative work, and work with um, advocacy groups to really understand how any of these things work. <laughs> Taking the fun out of it, Kevin. Hi, um, I just wanted to say thank you very much for your talk and presentation there. I really enjoy it. Um, in particular, I guess, um, comment and a question, so I'll be quick. Um, I'm a postgraduate student. Um, I am looking towards carving out a career in academia, um, critical race theory, to, you know, to hope to teach sociology from a critical race theory perspective in black feminist, the colonial, critical Muslim, critical Islamic studies perspective. Now, I'm well aware of the terrain that I'm navigating. It's um, particularly in terms of differences between the UK and opportunities of where you can go globally. Um, and I guess what I wanted to kind of ask you um, is, given your area, <coughs> area of research, what are your thoughts around the movements that um, sprung up around about this time last year around why is my curriculum right, um, roads must fall, because they take the issue of race, um, racism you know, to, to the academy, um, to yep. the university. And I'd like to know what your, what your thoughts around them and in terms of do you think that these student led movements are in a position to um, impose a level of structural change or will the white liberal space just all close us and be like, just go on about your business, it's fine, we'll hear it, we'll, hear, we'll give you more. Um, more of what you want, more you know, books of colour in your library, um, and give you kind of, you know, things that will show you what, what's the one I'm asking is, but in your opinion, will it affect anything when you change? Right. Will it bring you Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, <coughs> so there's an idea in, in, in CRT, you'll have heard of, of interest convergence. <coughs> So the, Derek Bell argued that um, if you look historically at the, mo the landmark moments where it looks like race equality has really moved forward, it's actually moved forward because white people have spotted a benefit for themselves in it. And, it, it's, uh, and you see a sense of this when people say, well, here's the business case for race equality. And that always falls flat on its face because it's not that white people have, have, have somehow listened to a rational argument and said, oh yeah, you're right actually, we shouldn't be as bad as we have been, let's be a little bit less racist. When you look at the cases, they've been forced into it. You get to a situation where actually the current settlement, politically and socially, 
is no longer sustainable. And if the establishment doesn't seem to give some ground, they could lose a lot more ground. <laughs> so if you look at the Stephen Lawrence case, you look at the headlines that were generated after the Stephen Lawrence inquiry was published, there was no way the government could have said, oh, actually, things have changed a lot since then. So all of the headlines were about shame, about a nation shamed, about the police shamed. And so Tony Blair said, oh, we're going to change the laws. We're going to change the country. And they did change the laws. The laws were really radical, but they just weren't enforced. Because once they changed the laws, the system went, actually, we've changed the law. Let's just get on. Well, you had Lawrence. What more do you want? So you're talking about the campaigns. Why is my curriculum white? Why isn't my professor black? Um, I think those are vital campaigns. I don't think they can bring about change automatically because the system, when the system thinks about it, knows that it's racist. It will only change when those campaigns gain such momentum that the system can't fob them off anymore. When the system has to say, look, this is what we're doing. And the race equality charter mark, I think, is really vital in that because what you have in the race equality charter program is universities having to ask themselves seriously searching questions. So if a university um, produces a report that says actually we're pretty good, they ain't going to get the charter mark. And universities are already seeing the charter mark as something that they need to have. Not, not as a kind of nice badge they can put, another logo they can put on their web page, but increasingly as something that if they don't have it, it's a bad mark. The absence of it means that they're just not a proper university. Now, we're not there yet, but if it continues to build in the way that it is and it gets support from those kinds of movements, the moment that it starts to appear in university league tables, watch <coughs> universities giving more and more credence to those kinds of campaigns. And it's at that point that the battle really starts because then you've, you're given some space, but not much. So then the question is, well, why is my professor white? How do we have more professors? Um, and students have a vital role in that. Um, I was in a meeting at a university that will remain anonymous, but maybe the university that I work at, where we were talking <laughs> about these things. And um, uh, someone, someone very high up, um, uh, possibly um, uh, one of the most important people at the university, said, well, of course, you know, we do want to have a more diverse faculty. But it takes a long time. You know, we have to grow people, we have to support them. And the, the head of the Caribbean Society said, why? There are plenty of qualified black people out there. They might not be on your staff at them. Go out and find them. You're a Russell Group University. Why can't you go out and recruit them? Fantastic. Absolutely brilliant. And coming from a student society, that kind of just straight talk, you know, can we just cut the shit? We'll go out and find some. Brilliant. That had more impact than any analysis I could have presented around statistics. So that there is an opportunity building, but I think it's building at a moment when mainstream politics and political discourse is probably more poisonous now than at any point it's been since the Second World War. I mean, the kind of stuff, you know, the, the stuff on the radio this morning, you know, we've allowed in what? 14, 14 refugees, and the, and the government are saying, well, we need to test their teeth. We're not sure they're children. Some, somebody from a refugee group was on Radio 5 Live this morning, and she made a really good point. It was quite subtle for the, the UKIP guy that was on against her. Um, <laughs> that actually, if they're 18 or not, they're still human beings. And the guy was like, effectively, we're not talking about human beings here. We're talking about a legitimate need of the British people to be reassured. The level of, of straightforward, in-your-face race hatred that masquerades as plain-talking politics these days is quite disgusting. It's unbelievable. Um, so there, there, there is a space, but I think that space is contested at every single moment. And, and the more that those kind of campaigns link in with university um, uh, lecturers' unions, with, with vice chancellor organisations, with departments across universities. I mean, if you want to get movement on this, get the Russell Group involved. Have the Russell Group saying, well, it would be, it would be unthinkable for a member of the Russell Group not to have the race equality charter mark. 
that would be fantastic. I mean, you know, you'll still have to fight them at every move, but it would be a damn sight better than where we are. The Russell Group doesn't say that, and that's, that tells you something about the Russell Group. It would be a, I'd, I'd be a terrible host if I didn't ask Phil, who I asked to sit at the front, to... Oh, no, no, I, I can't compete with David. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 is there anything, I was just thinking, is, is there anything you, you'd like to say about um, the, the Race Quality Charter, Mark, or anything to do with uh, uh, new migrants or an education or...? Well, I think mostly I couldn't agree with David more in terms... I, I, I just sit here recognising what a huge challenge it is to, to, to get movement in these areas and to do things as well as possible. And I sit here feeling entirely both guilty and embarrassed by the fact that I'm the senior race champion for the university and I'm fat, bald, white and middle class. <laughs> um, at least I'm fat, bald and white, I suppose, which does put me in some kind of ethnic, in some kind of uh, minority. Um, I, you know, I, I think we should be doing everything we can to to encourage applications wherever we can get them to promote people i'm i'm trying to look at ways of uh, of, of making our promotion uh, system more accessible and more and, and better for uh, and uh, well like i said it, it, I, I just i want it to happen um and i want to do something about it but i i know it's not there is no silver bullet uh, we've just got to keep on chipping away at it um, as quickly as possible, not as slowly as possible. Um, I think also, you know, I, I just take picking up David's last point, I think it is, it's quite difficult actually being in a university like ours, which is probably downtrodden and maltreated in every extent of the world by, by, by the outside world. Um, I, I, come from, I came here from London South Bank University, which was even more badly treated, I think, in terms of our, our perception as not a good university. Um, and we need we need solidarity from all areas of the university sector to get this thing other right. Otherwise, you just told that you're yeah. special pleading because you're you shouldn't be there. And I suppose the thing you know, just looking at things like attainment, it embarrasses the hell out of me um, at differential attainment levels. But actually, what scares the hell out of me is the fact that you're only looking at the the, the students who are here. Um, it's all the ones who never got here. Um, and, and the inequalities that, that, that lead up to that as well. Yeah. I just want to get a sense of the, t the temperature of the room, really, in terms of time, because it's gone past 7.30. Are you okay? Could we carry on for a little bit longer? Is that okay? Okay, can I get my, can I get my cube back, please? <laughs> uh. it, w it won't break if you throw it. It's, it's meant to be... <laughs> Alright, so we've got a few, we've got yes. one, then Stefan, and then Tom. <coughs> Hello. Um, Hi. Thanks, Hi. Um, I just wondered if you had any thoughts on the fact that the rest of the press and the government is about male working Can we get, we'll get, we'll do this three questions again. So can you pass it over that way to Stefan in the corner, please? If you have to leave, please. Uh, you exit quietly like AJ is. Thank you. Good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Not picking on anyone. Yeah, if, yeah. Uh, David, I was, I was wondering whether you saw any value in the research that is super diversity um, also at, uh, at Birmingham and, and, and whether you think that possibly um, uh, nuances us into a corner in terms of being able to mobilise um, politically. Um, around uh, around racialised politics. Uh, how, how, do, how do you react to that? Hmm. I suppose it's, it's related to something that's cropped up this week in, in, uh, in my own department where for years I've been uh, sort of shouting about how we, we don't discuss, um, I suppose, even recruitment, retention, anything to do with um, minoritised ethnic <coughs> students because historically We've always had a very, uh, always had very strong student numbers, and therefore there's never been an issue. So all we recruit, so who cares? Mm. Um, and then all of a sudden, we we've experienced quite a sharp decline in student numbers. And I got an email from my line manager, basically saying, "So what can we do about this ethnic minority thing? Because um, our, our numbers have dropped from eight percent to six percent, um, and it just sort of got my blood boiling. Thinking, well, so now they're the they're the solution to our." Our sort of 
a debt problem, yeah. so to speak. And, and it, I was just curious on, on, on your sort of perception of of that kind of managerial mentality, really. It's like, well, when, when it hits the fan, then we'll start looking for for our, our hard-to-reach widening participation groups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm okay. sure we're not an isolated case. Well, that, that, that's interest <coughs> convergence. So, so universities get interested in widening participation and opening up new markets when they can't rely on the traditional students to, to, to pay the bills. There's interest convergence. It's, it's, it's a momentary advantage that you can take advantage of. So if someone's saying, what's, what's the problem with our ethnic minority student? There's an opportunity to say, well, we need to do this because we're clearly doing something wrong. Why don't we have a course that, that builds on the momentum of why is the curriculum why? Let's do, so there's a little chink of light. Can you pull it apart and do something more, take advantage of it? Um, the question about super diversity, um, there's, a, there's a big research institute at Birmingham University called um, IRIS, um, the Institute for Research in Super Diversity. Super diversity is this idea um, uh, started with Stephen Vertevec that, um, <coughs> that in the past migration was about um, big numbers but only from a small number of groups, whereas now it's small numbers but from a massive number of different groups. So diversity has gone bananas. Um, they had a round table about a year ago where they had myself and, and four people talking from more critical perspectives, <laughs> uh, in particular critical race theory. And we were um, all of the mind that super diversity was exaggerated, that um, you know, when I first started teaching in London um, 25 years ago, it, routinely schools in London had 120 different languages spoken. Nobody talked about super diversity and a lot of the schools did it very well and they weren't, you didn't have to teach 120 languages, you had to have a, an awareness of about four community languages, you'd cover 90% of the kids. So I think my sense is that super diversity has become a bit of a buzzword um, and that um, government are terribly interested in it because they use it as a language within which they can address issues of control, <coughs> they can count people, they can, super diversity sounds terribly, as um, a colleague from Manchester said, it sounds super, <laughs> <laughs> super, and it's diverse, it's fabulous, but people working critically on race know that diversity, the word diversity, when you hear that word, you start to kind of worry, because we're not talking about diversity, I'm talking about racism, I'm talking about power, and, that, and what I'm talking about isn't a function of how many migrants there are. It's a function of how threatened white people feel about re retaining their own superiority and supremacy. So um, super diversity for me is, is um, a bit of a diversion. It could be used positively. Some of the research coming out of IRIS is superb. Some of it is really great research. But some of the work that takes place under the heading of super diversity is about a form of eugenics. It's about controlling populations and changing their nature. So when, when politicians talk <laughs> about, of course we need migr migrants, but we need the brightest and the best. They're, it's about eugenics. They're talking about changing the nature of particular populations. <laughs> and I think that stuff is, is incredibly dangerous. Mm. The question about that, it, it's about a lot of those headlines are about white working class boys, is really, um, it's not accidental, it's, it's vital. Um, uh, because we live in a patriarchal society and as I said a while ago in terms of intersectionality racism is always gendered it's always classed and it's always ableist these things don't switch off disability sexuality gender class race they are always there and they're always working sometimes together sometimes across each other you see in the, the, the whole white working class boys emphasis a real um, nasty element of, of the patriarchy in the way that you see in the whole Ched Evans stuff. The, 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 the fact that the guy got off is that we've had celebratory racism after the referendum. The celebratory 
sexism's too small, but the hatred that's poured out, the venom that's poured out against women in the reaction, the kind of celebration of we told you, we told you what she was. I mean, it, it, you really wonder where, what, what kind of a society we're, we're living in where, where there's that kind of celebration and hatred. Um, and it's important in all of these education debates, it is all gendered, it is all race, it is all class. The, the grammar school debate, one of the things that pe most people don't know the 11 plus, they set different pass rates for boys and girls. Because if they set the same pass rate, <laughs> grammar schools would be full of girls. <laughs> and, so, and so what they did was, when, when there were lots of grammar schools, they said, well, that'd be unfair. Obviously, that's not right. That's a, <laughs> that's a, that's a kind of artifact of the 11 plus. So they set a lower pass rate for boys, because obviously it would be unfair not to have an equal number of boys. They didn't do that for kids from disadvantaged backgrounds they certainly never thought about doing it for minority ethnic kids because their underrepresentation merely confirmed what the people setting the tests knew which is that those kids aren't very clever so the whole grammar school debate w w also has potential to blow up in their face when somebody makes it to the front page of of the daily mail saying well are we going to disadvantage middle-class white girls to support their lazy middle-class white brothers? Because that's, that's one way that they would present the figures if you said that you were setting a lower pass rate um, for black students or for students with English as an additional language. Because I've never heard any suggestion that that should happen. Because that would be cheating. Uh, we've got, I think, one more question. Uh, and then I'm hoping that there's still food out there. We can go out there and, and network a little bit. So uh, you, might, you might want to take two plus. This is a bit dismal. <laughs> oh, who's got, who's who's got the block? block um, no, it is a bit. So if you want to take a more positive one, I understand. No, not at all. Let's let's hear it. All right. we're, so we're all intrigued now. Uh, are you sure? Because yeah. it is a bit dismal. Because <laughs> I've been so upbeat all night. <laughs> said just triggered it so do you mind is it all right yeah i don't okay. know what you okay. say but sorry please. it's just uh, no it's just something that you wouldn't hear otherwise uh, it was when you were talking about uh, the us uh, mm. and and the uk and it was just something that happened to me a year ago um i went to uh, to uh, a family um thing at inquest organization mm. uh, because of my sister she's got a learning disability and i don't need to talk about that uh, but one thing I was struck when I went in there, uh, most people when I went in, um, there were maybe about 100 people there, most people when I went in uh, were uh, black people. Uh, maybe about a quarter of us were, were white people. And most of the white people were there because uh, members of their family had died uh, in, <coughs> in healthcare situations. Yeah. And you can imagine yeah. what black people's relatives where they died and that's basically what yeah. I wanted to say and I found that yeah. really horrifying. No, Inquest do, do fantastic work. If you look at their website, um, I, the no, organisation Inquest, they're it, it, still helping me but I wasn't there yeah. because, my, because my sister had died. No, they, they do astonishing work. Um, wh when I wrote, um, I was writing a book and, and, and trying to chart the, the, the timeline of the Stephen Lawrence inquiry because everybody, everybody, lots of people would say to me, yeah, but this Lawrence changed the world. And I was trying to understand Lawrence from a CRT perspective. Uh, so I started just doing a timeline. And there are so many Stephen Lawrence cases where uh, black people, particularly black young men, are murdered inside hospitals and secure <coughs> units. Um, and they're f it's always the family with the support of numerous anti-racist groups, as it was in the Stephen Lawrence case. And you get the most horrendous evidence after years and years and years of campaigning by Inquest and other groups. And the evidence comes out and the, 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 the health trust says, oh, we're terribly sorry, we've learnt lots of lessons. And then it happens again but six weeks later. But most of these weren't, weren't health related. 
that there were no, there were nearly all to do with the criminal justice right. system. Yeah. Whereas old white people there, they were nearly all health related. But the deaths in custody, th there's there's also a massive disproportionality of, of black deaths in secure units and health units. The the, the people that that restrain patients and lead to their death on the floor, described as nurses, which which conjures up an image of the which is very different. To the to six blokes lying on top of a man who can't breathe, but in the states they 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 film that kind of murder because it's done by the police on the streets. As I said earlier, in the UK, they do it behind locked doors. <laughs>